Welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones. Answering your questions tonight, astrophysicist and atheist Lawrence Krauss. Howard government minister turned radio national broadcaster Amanda Vanstone. Jean Robinson, the first openly gay man to be ordained a bishop in a major church. The leader of the Christian Democratic Party, Reverend Fred Nile. And Hawke government minister, now age discrimination commissioner, Susan Ryan. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. And as usual, we're being simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio. And you can join the Twitter conversation with the Quanda hashtag. Our first question tonight comes from Amy Judge. Hi. My question is for Fred Nile. I've read that you believe homosexuality to be a lifestyle choice that is immoral, unnatural, and abnormal. When did you make the choice to be straight? <laughs> A well, choice you. you maintain to this very day. Well, thank you for quoting me accurately. Yes, I do agree with what you just said. And uh, I was born straight. Oh, so you didn't make a choice? No, I was born straight. So, um, All the heterosexuals are born the way they are. Mm. So being gay is a matter of choice, but being straight, that's in your DNA, is that right? It's a way of choice because I, I've met a lot of uh, homosexuals who are no longer homosexuals. So. If, if it's some way you're born that way, you can't change, and people do change. I've had some uh, friend of mine who was uh, previously the leader of the gay liberation movement and is now a committed Christian. He's no longer homosexual. So I think it is a life choice. Uh, can I jump in here? I have a question. So, you know, homosexuality is, is ubiquitous throughout nature. In fact, probably 1,500 species. My favorite one is sheep because there's, there's homosexuality in, in, in many species, but there's only one that I know of that particularly uh, exhibits the fact of, that when uh, that they choose unique partners. And rams, 10% of rams have sex with only other rams. Now I'm wondering if that's a lifestyle choice too. <laughs> Oh, just a crazy, a crazy mixed up ram, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to actually go to Gene Robson. Do you regard your sexuality as a matter of choice? Well, I, I appreciate getting a voice here since I, I, I may be the only gay person on the panel. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm very happy. I think it's the experience of most uh, gay and lesbian people that indeed uh, uh, this is something that was determined long before choice was uh, remotely uh, an option. Uh, and in fact, all the research shows that sexual orientation is set uh, by the time one is three years old, uh, much earlier than uh, any kind of meaningful choice can be made. Um, I think. Uh, uh, given the, the stigma against um, gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people, uh, you'd have to have your head examined to, to choose it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think it's, it's really important to understand that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't choose to be straight if we had that option, uh, because we are who we are, and um, some of us are even rather fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, can I just ask you, um, you, you mentioned, uh, or you alluded to the science, um, mm -hmm. in the early part of your answer, uh, sexuality determined by age three. Uh, what is the science? Um, we've heard in the past about the gay gene, and by this, I don't mean... I you. am the gay yes, gene. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, appreciate, I appreciate this coincidence there, but do, have you followed the latest science? <laughs> The, the, the science, as I understand it, is that uh, we still don't know the, the mixture of nurture versus nature. Uh, but as I say, whatever that mixture is, it's uh, determined by the age of three, uh, long before uh, a choice is any, anything meaningful. Um, and certainly it's, it's borne out by the, by the experience of LGBTI people themselves. Uh, this is something uh, one discovers about oneself as you live uh, um, through your life because, uh, uh, you know, we grow up learning the same things everyone else does. We're told all the awful things about us. And so coming out to oneself is the, is the hardest part. Uh, and then I would go on to say, uh, learning that God loves us as much as love, uh, God loves every one of God's children, 
uh, is the really thrilling part, and knowing that nothing can separate us from God's love. Uh, Lawrence, well, just want to jump there, in. There. Yeah, there's more science than that, though. There's lots of science that shows, first of all, the science I was talking about, the fact that it's ubiquitous in biology. It's obviously biologically based, but there's a lot of science recently uh, looking at genetic basis of homosexuality, epigenetics particularly, uh, not so much uh, in the gene, but in gene expression. And there's, there's just overwhelming evidence that it's biological. And, and that's kind of the thing that I think I object to most as a scientist, is that someone like Fred decides in advance or reads some book written by Iron Age peasants 2,000 years ago before we know the Earth or orbited the sun, and, and, and decides that it has to be unnatural. But how can it be unnatural if it's so natural? Yeah, I, I, I just want to hear from you very briefly on this from our other two panelists. Let's start with Susan Ryan, your thoughts. Well, I agree entirely with the scientific view on this. Uh, as you say, it's ubiquitous. We understand we all grew up. Us older people grew up in a society where homosexuality was repressed. People didn't like to talk about it. People didn't like to, it was happening. But as we understood that some people were homosexual, we then look around the world and every society, be it, be it a, a, an old society, a modern society, be it an urban, rural, in every society, is it about 10% gene? Um, probably a little less than two. Two percent. Two percent. Two percent. Let's quickly let's, uh, let's bring Amanda let's, in here. Just let's just not quibble. To me, it yep. is a part of nature. Mm -hmm. It is a part of the fabulous diversity of human beings, and we have fabulous mm -hmm. gene over here <laughs> to prove that. But no, I think it is absolutely a part of uh, human society. Uh, thank you for the sheep. Stuff I didn't know that. <laughs> let's, uh, it's let's, great uh, having a scientist on the program. But and therefore we should all recognise that <laughs> equality, legal equality, marriage equality, must be extended to people. It is absolutely okay. unacceptable. That's for a brief answer, and I'll get one from Amanda Van Stern. I'm sure you will get a, a brief one. Susan and I have agreed dangerously on a number of things over a long period of time, and I agree uh, with what she says now. And the question I'd put to Fred Nile, if I may, is. Um, if, if you believe that society is made up of people who are dependent on each other, who are prepared to say, I'll care and look <coughs> after this person, as opposed to wanting the state to do it, why in God's name wouldn't you be in favour of gay marriage? Can I, I'll, I'll pause you on that thought. We've actually got a question about this and we'll take I'm it right now. Well, I'll be answer. Yeah, I know, but you don't get to ask questions. <laughs> the people in the audience do. So the next question comes from David Fuad. My question is directed towards Jean Robinson. Jean, being a bishop, a leader, and an example for many Christians in the world, how can you encourage the act of homosexuality when it has been condemned numerous times in the Bible, being called unnatural, unrighteous, lawless, an abomination, and shameless? And being a Christian, how can you encourage gay marriage when Christ himself said that God made the male and female, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife? Amen to that. <clears throat> Faithful Christians, many of us, uh, progressive Christians, uh, understand the Bible in its context. The whole notion of sexual orientation is only about 140 years old. It was um, at the latter part of the 19th century that, the, that the, the notion that a certain minority of us would be born affectionately oriented towards people of the same gender uh, rather than the opposite gender, uh, that's, it's a new concept. You can't take a, a modern day concept, read it back into an ancient scripture without doing violence to the scripture. Um, the the, the three-day seminar on this, uh, constricted down to one or two sentences, is uh, that the Bible is not talking about what we are talking about today, which is faithful, monogamous, lifelong intentioned relationships between two people of the same gender. Uh, as far as the Christian community and my role in it as a bishop, it seems to me that I'm, I'm doing far more for the faith uh, in trying to live a life of integrity, uh, being honest in a way that all the gay bishops before me were not honest, um, and, and standing up for who I am, which is a child of God who happens to be gay and is absolutely convinced of God's love for me. Briefly, um, Jean, briefly, in, in your book, you, you actually make the case that uh, you support marriage as an institution. In fact, you want more people to be married because the, the that first, will make the institution stronger, including Yeah, the, you know, the, the first uh, line in my book is, I believe in marriage. I do. Uh, I witnessed my own parents 66 years uh, married and 
and and uh, uh, hope I live long enough to uh, achieve that. I'm up to 25 years so far with my partner and now my mm -hmm. husband. Um, I, you know, it's interesting to me, and I, I would join you in this, that I, I, I can't imagine that the conservatives aren't all for this. You know, for years they accused us of shallow relationships and promiscuity, and here we've got people wanting to pledge themselves uh, in faithful commitment to one another and, uh, and in support of the institution of marriage. Okay, let's, let's hear from Fred Nile then, because it seems you do agree on one thing. The institution of marriage is important. He just wants more people to get married. <laughs> well, he, he doesn't recognise the truth that he wants, his actions will under, undermine marriage. Marriage, the way God intended it, was to be between a male and a female. That's the institution of marriage. It can't be two men or two women. And you're undermining the institution. And I, I'm in favour of the institution. I, I was married for 53 years. I want to uphold the institution of marriage. And I know people are arguing what you're saying. Where you're for marriage, so you want homosexuals to get married. But you actually are torpedoing the institution of marriage and undermining it. I think and what's torpedoing the institution of marriage is the very marriage. high number of heterosexual people who are jumping out of it. <laughs> yeah, okay. let's get all done. But to, to, I want to. I want to. I'm sure we'll get to talk more about marriage, but but uh, uh, I, I want to go back to the question a little bit because it seems to me I actually kind of agree with them a little bit. I can't quite understand why you stay in the church. I mean. Look you, look, you read the Bible and it's pretty explicit. You know, there's that wonderful section, really heartwarming, where Lot gets visited by these angels, men, and the townspeople want to take them on rape. And he says, no, no, rape my daughters instead. And, you know, it's one of those wonderful parts of the Bible. And, uh, and, and I'm just, when you read all of this and, you know, you read that men who lay together should be killed and all that, you know, you can interpret it all you want, but... But you're sort of picking and choosing, I think. You decide you want to be a Christian, and you throw out the stuff you don't like, like I think most Christians do, actually. Throw out the stuff you don't like, keep the stuff you do. Why not just throw out the whole thing and just be happy and love people and be gay? <laughs> it's a fair question you can ask. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm actually delighted to respond to that question. Um, it's the experience of the living God in my own life. That's why I stick with it. That's why uh, I believe that the, that the church, the synagogue, the mosque can constantly reform itself because God's will is being re revealed to us over time. We're constantly um, uh, understanding better God's will and this is one of those places uh, where we're changing what we have believed for two or three thousand years. Um, I, I believe that scripture is, is holy in the sense that it is the story of people who have had an experience with the living God and we read it in order to know where to look in our own lives for an experience of the living God. And, and so uh, I do believe in it. Uh, the church has got a lot to apologize for, but then again, don't we all? And uh, I, I believe that this is the way uh, to discern God's will, and, uh, and, and I'm thrilled to be a part of okay, it. Okay, I'm just going to go to uh, Fred Nart here. What makes you think that you understand God's will, and he, the bishop, does not? <laughs> because I take as my authority uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, and also the living word, and I believe that God gave to us the written word, the Holy Bible. And as a bishop, you would know, the church for 2,000 years and longer, has upheld marriage as it is and has also said that homosexuality is immoral, unnatural and so on. Well, so, so you are going against the teaching of the church. So Lawrence and brings so up... So you should be ashamed uh, to be a bishop and going against the teaching of the church. I'm just going to interrupt because uh, I'm agreeing the with the atheist over there. Just hold on, the, the Bible is always open to interpretation. We've actually got a question on this subject from Rebecca Chrysler. Um, so why is it that when the Bible contains something that's obviously ethically wrong, for example, happy are those who seize your children and smash them against a rock, which is in Psalm 137, religious people claim that the Bible is just a guideline and shouldn't be taken literally. So why is it the second Psalm brings up gay marriage, they use the Bible as a concrete reason to oppose it? Yeah, Fred Nile. <clears throat> the Bible has many messages, I think, is part of the point there, including some very violent ones. Yes. Well, um, we, as you heard uh, yes. earlier from Lawrence Well, Cross. we understand that, that you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Jesus made it very clear 
that he had replaced the Old Testament with the emphasis it did have uh, with the New Testament and said, I have a new commandment for you to love one another. And so Jesus brought in a completely new emphasis, which is what I follow as a Christian. But um, can I just make the point that Gene and his partner love one another? Isn't that following the teaching? Well, I'm not... Gene has to answer to God, not to Fred Nile. And I'm and, delighted to answer and, to God for uh, that. And, and uh, I, am, I am worried because there is a passage in the Bible with Jesus where he said that in the last days, some people will come to me and start saying, Lord, 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 and uh, think that they're on the right side. And he, and he said, I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. So you must be very careful where you are in your own uh, personal Should salvation and your relationship with God. I'd like to quite like doubt to... as a motivator. <clears throat> I mean, that, that's you're you're saying that the people might choose to follow a particular path because they've been frightened by the scripture that says if you don't, you might not get into, mm. get into heaven. Well, frankly, that's not only heaven I want to get into. Uh, yeah. my, my grandmother used to say, if you if you are nice to people every day, because she didn't make us go to Sunday school um, <laughs> when we stayed with her, she said, if you're nice to people every day, other than to defend yourself, because that's you know, the box on's fair enough then. Uh, you'll get into any heaven worth getting into. Now, how could you disagree with that? Guys, can I... Uh, can I okay, uh, Lawrence, I, I know you want to jump in, but I think... Only that is different from the teaching of the New Testament. It, it, well, it's can nice I just, can, can I just, So you can be a nice person we, we've, your we've whole got, life and can, still can not get into heaven. Excuse me for one That's second. Right. Just That's not right. worth going there. Yes. Yes. On, this, <laughs> on this table, <laughs> we have two... To have eternal life, you have to believe in Jesus Christ as Saviour. Excuse me for one minute. It's only one way. So I will give you a chance to answer this, but on this table, we've got two different interpretations of the New Testament. We've got genes, and I'd like to... Maybe three. Uh, yes, oh, indeed. Two theological too. interpretations. So, so uh, Jean, what <coughs> did Jesus say about homosexuality? Uh, Jesus said nothing about homosexuality. Uh, this was also, I mean, uh, I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say and what I'm not saying. This is a man who remained single uh, throughout his lifetime in a culture that virtually demanded marriage. He spent most of his time with 12 men. He singled three of them out for special leadership. And one of them is known as the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. I think to, to uh, solicit Jesus into the uh, notion of, of nuclear families, a uh, husband, a wife, and 2.2 children, uh, begs the question of, uh, the fact that Jesus actually had a very uh, kind of alternate lifestyle. I'm not saying he was gay. I'm not saying that he ever had sex with anyone. I'm just saying that, that this <laughs> is a man who lived couldn't. outside the normal boundaries of his own culture and, and knew about a family of choice. When his mother and brothers came to uh, fetch him once at a house and he was told they were outside, he said, who, who are my mothers and brothers? They're the ones who do the will of God. So uh, I think... Um, uh, we have lots of room to, uh, to wonder about um, uh, this Jesus who was always reaching out to the marginalized, to the oppressed, and, and was always advocating for them, usually against the moral arbiters of that day. Okay, now Fred, there's the other interpretation of the New Testament. Yes. According to Jean, Jesus said nothing about homosexuality. Yes, well, he's misrepresenting what Jesus said. What did he say? Uh, Jesus, for example, did say what marriage is. When they were asking him, he said, marriage is where a man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave to his wife, the two shall become one. <laughs> two men cannot become one, two women cannot become one. But God has made us biologically so a male and a female can become one and complement each other. Mm. So that's the first thing. There is also a code word in the New Testament. And Jesus often referred to Sodom. And everybody, and it's been all quoted here already, you quoted the story. So every Jewish listener knew what Jesus was referring to when he said, it's going to be worse for you than it was for Sodom. He only had to use the word Sodom. They all knew what the story is about, uh, where the men wanted to have sex uh, with these two attractive, I assume they were attractive angels, male angels. Actually, Fred, you're quite wrong about that. If you go back and read, you'll, uh, you'll see that Jesus said that the sin of Sodom was its ill treatment of the poor. Well, let, let me jump in and say, I mean, we're all pretending Jesus was this great guy, but, but uh, um, let, let's, let's step back and say, this guy also seemed to say, if you don't believe in me, you know what, you'll be condemned to 
for, you know, you won't get to heaven, you'll be condemned eternally to pain and worse than the people in Sodom God, just for not believing in me. What kind of God would you, I mean, you know, it's, what kind of love is that? What kind that of love? Was, people who are loving, caring, hmm. good people will go to hell for all eternity for choosing, choosing to, to have the, to use their brains. And I no. find that uh, just, okay. you know. I'm here from, straight up, from here from Susan, uh, who's been left out a little bit on the end of it. Well, I'm not gay. I'm not married. I don't, I'm not a great fan of marriage. I have been married. So maybe I haven't got a lot to, <laughs> maybe I haven't got a lot to say, but I've got this. I, I was brought up a Catholic, and, and our uh, religious education was really the New Testament, not the Old Testament. And the parts of that that I remember very fondly, and that indeed I have brought into my political life and, and my human rights work, uh, is not uh, whether Jesus said Sodom or the, uh, it's feeding the sick. It's healing the, the uh, uh, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, even raising someone from the dead, which is the ultimate healing. It's uh, throwing the uh, usurers out of the temple. It's including women in the conversation he was having with his disciples. Uh, the, it's saying suffer the little children. They're the things that I think are worthwhile, even though I'm not signed up to any religion these days, Lawrence, because I think they're things you know, we, we can all incorporate. But, but this argument endlessly about, uh, Fred, that you're going about this was in the Old Testament. I mean, we're here now. It's 2013. We've got responsibilities to each other. We've got responsibilities to the people Jesus Christ apparently looked after. Let's go for it. Yeah, but I'll, I'll just to sort of end this part of the discussion, can I just bring Fred back in here? I mean, are you worried uh, if you create a kind of exclusive world uh, where your version of Christianity leaves out people like Gene, that that's actually bad? Well, I'm not leaving him out. He's excluding himself. I haven't left him out. I want him to come well, in. In fact, I, he's, I he's him. not excluding I, himself in the sense that he's like, a bishop with his own congregation. I'd like at the end of this program to say, I, I believe in what you've just seen saying, Fred. But are all the people happy who might do that. also believe in God, but from other religions, are also excluded, I presume. So that all the so basically you're an atheist about all the other religions. It's just yours that you're not. Is that correct? I, I leave it to God. He's the judge, and so, he will no, judge but, each but person. But are they excluded if you're not a Christian, but you say you're, you're a very faithful Muslim or a faithful Jew? Are you excluded? I'm just saying God will judge them, not me. Okay. And I, well, and then, I, then, and I know God is a, a loving a, God, and God will be fair in his dealing with each we've individual. We've got a question from the floor. Who put up his hand? I'll just quickly get you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi there, Fred. Um, I want to ask you, when the suicide rate is so high in LGBT teens, when you use such hateful and disgusting language about them, do you not feel, or I think maybe you should, feel slightly responsible for some of this, some of this that goes on? Like, I must, I must object to that because I, I will give you $1,000 if you can find anywhere where I've said anything which is hateful or vicious about homosexuals. Okay? Okay, I think it is you time to move on. You won't find it. You won't find it. I think it's time to move along. Our next question, and it's on a different subject, comes from Charles Northcote. Panel, good evening. In light of recent events in the UK, namely the horrific terrorist murder of the British soldier Lee Rigby, we have terrorism coming from within. Let me quote the word of Ayatollah Khomeini. Islam makes it incumbent upon all males to prepare themselves for the conquest of countries so that the writ of Islam, Sharia, is obeyed by every country in the world. Those who know nothing about Islam pretend it counsels against war. Those are witless. Islam says kill all unbelievers just as they would kill you. How do you propose to make a stand against such radical behaviour and belief systems? Lawrence Krauss, let's start with you. Well, I think the way you make a stand is the way you make a stand against all religious nonsense. You, you, you point out there's nothing, actually Islam I don't think is that different than Christianity. It's 500 years behind the game, but Christianity was doing the same stuff 500 years ago. I think you have to point, I, I think you have to point out that, um, that we all have a common humanity and that the myths and silly stories in Islam are just as silly as the ridiculous stories in the Bible. And that, we, and that we, we teach kids to in fact get their beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than deciding in advance what, what is right before they even ask the question. So education, I'm an educator and I said it before, but if, you know, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. 
And, and uh, to me, it's education. You educate people. What you're talking about is really ignorance. I think you can control people by keeping them ignorant. And you see the Taliban doing it in Afghanistan. They have madrasas that get kids to memorize uh, sections of the Quran instead of teaching them mathematics. And so the more knowledge you have about the world, the less likely you are to, to that kind of radical hatred, it seems to me. Ahmed Evanston, uh, the question began by talking about... Thank you. The question began by talking about the, uh, the murder of that young uh, trooper in a suburb in London, hacked to pieces by two people who were trying to make a political point. Um, how do you actually deal with that? Well, I, I suspect um, British people can deal with it better than legislation or intelligence agencies can. And uh, if you were there, I think the best thing to do is find your Muslim friends. Uh, if you've got some, if you haven't, find some and make friends with them. And find uh, your uh, friends who've come from Africa or who are the children who've come from Africa and go out to dinner with them. Make a public statement that not everybody is like that. Uh, I think if you let the media uh, s stories of this push us into a, it's us versus them, that's what you'll get. Uh, what you have to do is say, no, it's not us versus them. It's all of us over here against those few crazy nutters. Susan Ryan. <laughs> Well, I, I couldn't put it better than Amanda has. It is about embracing and including people. And I think we do that very well in Australia. Not well enough. We've still got some issues. But the more we provide every community uh, opportunity to uh, people of Islamic faith coming to, to live in Australia, the, the better it will be. And the other thing that always... I always say helps in any, in any situation about religion or terrorism is educate the women. The education Indeed. of women is the great solution to many a problem. Yeah, I agree with that, absolutely. Fred, just a quick comment. I object to your comparison of the Islamic religion and those quotes uh, mm -hmm. with the New Testament. You'll find nothing in the New Testament which would encourage you to kill anybody. In no, in I, fact, didn't, I didn't say it was violent. I just said it was silly. No, <laughs> but you were, you were given the impression, as you said, oh. 500 years ago, what happened 500 years ago is not based on what the New Testament teaches. It's based on the Crusades and... And what well, I mean, think. I actually think the worst crime in the New Testament is the crucifixion of Jesus. It seems to me amazing that, 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 that you solve the problems of the world by having someone sacrifice, by, by having this person <clears throat> vilely tortured and sacrificed for the sins of a non-existent forebearer who uh, made the mistake of taking an apple from a rib woman. I mean, it just, it just, it, 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 it just doesn't seem to make okay, sense. Right, Jesus was dying for all of our sins, your sins and my sins. And the okay, Bishop's Fred, sins. we went a bit off topic there mm. because the question was actually about terrorism and how to yeah. deal with it and uh, particularly Islamic extremism. Well, I'm very concerned about uh, Islam and I've spoken on this before and uh, what has been quoted is correct. It is in the Quran. So we, ha we have to have the... Uh, I don't think Islamic, that was a quote the from Muslim. the Quran. That was a quote from Ayatollah Khomeini. Yes, but he's quoting the Quran. There are verses in the Quran that say, "Cut off your, the hands of your enemies, their legs, crucify them, and oh, so on." Yes. What about and these fanatics can find Allah. those verses in the Quran, as as Bin Laden did, to justify their terrorism. Now, I believe the Islamic just like in leaders, fact, you could take uh, that psalm, which is out of the Old Testament, which suggests you could dash babies' heads against rocks uh, as part of a revenge against the Babylonians. That's the so point I'm like, making. That that's yeah. no longer relevant in the New Testament period. Jesus oh. said that was the old covenant. We are now under the new covenant. Okay, um, so I'm going to love, love, your, love, your, enemies. Okay, love your enemies. All right, I'm going to uh, interrupt us just for a moment because we've got another question on this topic. It's from uh, Rashad Farid. Last week, a British soldier was brutally mur murdered outside of his barracks. On May 2nd in Birmingham, a 72-year-old man was viciously stabbed. He was a Muslim returning home after prayer at his local mosque, and police deemed it racially motivated. Why is the attack on the British soldier considered an act of terrorism, while the other is just an act of racism? Do you blame the religion or the individuals who committed it? Jean uh, Robinson, let's start with you. <laughs> Uh, Rashad, I believe is your name? Yes. Uh, uh, I think you're absolutely right to point out this discrepancy. I think it, it points to uh, prejudice and bias on our part and the, the part of the media. Uh, uh, both are, are serious and both need to be taken seriously. Um, I, you know, I think we have extremists in every religion and Christians should be very humble about pointing out uh, someone else's extremism and we have just as many Christians would love to see a theocracy as, as Muslims or Jews. Uh, actually, the Jews are better on this than any of us. They, uh, they have uh, rarely ever wanted to take over the world. 
uh, the way some uh, some Christians uh, and Muslims have, have done. I think uh, I think that one of the one of the ways in which we can respond to this kind of, of terrorism is to uh, encourage the middle ground of all the religions to stand up and speak. We have let the extremists own the airwaves, own the own the blogs, own the social media. And, and those uh, people of peace in all of the world religions uh, and, and those of no religion uh, need to stand up and, and speak for, uh, for the vast majority of us who find all of those crimes uh, heinous. Uh, Fred, you, you've heard the comparison. Uh, sorry. A 72-year-old uh, Muslim man returning from prayer stabbed to death in the street and uh, the comparison is made with the uh, killing of the soldier who was hacked to death in the street. Um, the difference is, I suppose, that the killers in that case stood in front of phone cameras and told their reasons. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm just as critical of both uh, the individuals who carry out those horrific murders. I've got no uh, interest in supporting that. And I follow what Jesus said, love your enemies. And that's, that's a central teaching of the Christian faith. It's not a source of violence against people at all. Well, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I, who are the enemies in this case? Uh, I just don't know who the enemy. Are you saying the Islam is the enemy? Uh, I, well, you know, whoever, the whoever's, is, whoever's you, attacking you, whoever's yeah. attacking you, like in Cairo, mm -hmm. burning down the cathedral, uh, that's your enemy. So you still uh, love them, uh, but you try to I, I change that society. Part of the problem, and and here is that, and I, I agree with, of course, what you just said, but the, uh, that we label people. And, and religion is a wonderful way of labeling people and making us versus them. And so we don't see the people. We see them being Christians or Muslims. And we hate them because of that. And, and so that's one other reason why I think religion gets in the way, because it causes us to stereotype people instead of seeing people as individuals with a common humanity. But can I just interrupt there? Because in this particular case, the case of the, uh, the two men who killed mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a suburban street, mm -hmm. um, hacked to death, literally, wow. a, a British soldier, we did see them actually. Mm. We saw them as individuals and they used phone cameras uh, rather uniquely immediately after the event, still covered in blood, to explain their reasons. How do you deal with that? Look, the point is that obviously they were driven by hate. But the, my point was that they were not killing that, that poor young man because they knew him. They knew anything about him. They'd already labelled him by a bunch of labels. Military, representative of a, of a Christian state that had done supposed atrocities against, uh, against Islam, and that's the kind of labeling that leads people to be able to create, do these heinous acts because they no longer see people as people, but representative of something they hate. And that, to me, is the, one of the real problems of, of the us versus themness of, reli of religious groups that cause other people to no longer be people. Amanda, um, just taking the, uh, the young man's question up there, I mean, he's asking whether the two things are fundamentally different. The stabbing to death, a racist attack of, a, of an elderly Muslim man, and the, uh, the killing um, with knives and hatchets uh, of the uh, British soldier. I don't know the details of the second case, but they would seem, on what you've said, to be inextricably related. I mean, the more you have people saying Muslims want to go and kill everybody, the more you have whipping everyone else up into a frenzy of fear and apprehension and a feeling that they must deal with this. Um, so it goes back to what my granny said, if you lead a good life, you'll get into any heaven worth getting into. And it follows that you, you know, if I get up to heaven and St Peter says, gee, you made a mistake, you went to the Anglican church, you should have gone to a Catholic one or you should have gone to some other church. I'm going to be bitterly disappointed because I, was, I went to a Christian school and I was taught the need to be a good person and not judge people, as you say, on labels. It doesn't matter if they're Catholic or Anglican or Muslim or whatever. What matters is whether they are a good and decent person. And that's how we should be dealing with each other. And once you start this, well, they're Muslims, they want to kill you. Well, you, you're separating it out, you're getting into us and them, and you will have battles, ugly ones, where people will be killed. Steve Weinberg, who's a physicist and also an atheist, said that there are good people and there are bad people. And good people do good things and bad people do bad things. When good people do bad things, it's religion. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, I just uh, jump in here and the young man there with his hand up in the air. We'll just get a uh, microphone over to you. Just come in, Jean. Go ahead. Uh, it, let me just ask a, a quick question. I, I think the labeling. Ask a question. Oh no, no. <laughs> then I'll make a statement. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's what right. I was going to answer. Yeah. Uh, which is, I think we all have to be careful of labeling, and of I believe that you quite often make the distinction between atheists and religionists as being a, a kind of label. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back oh, okay. to the questioner in the front row there. Go ahead. Uh, Professor Krauss, yeah. you say uh, religion is the only way to make a good person do a bad thing. But don't you think you could turn that around and say, well, religion helps a lot of bad people to just be better and do good things? I mean, speaking for myself, yeah. I'm not a great person, but I'm a lot better because of my, the influence of Christianity has on me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Look, you can't deny that religion serves many good purposes in society. There's no doubt it brings people it, it brings people consolation at hard times. It brings people together in groups often and, and gives support groups. So, you know, it, it is indeed stereotypical to try and label it. My point is that we pretend that religion only is the basis of morality and leads to good things. And sometimes it does. But a lot of the times, and again, if you read the Old Testament, it's the one of the most immoral books ever written. Okay, I'm going to go to a, so another question. Sorry, very quickly, with respect, yeah. I think it's the... Religion's the only way you can have an objective set of moral values. Why? And if you look, well, well, what else? What else would you suggest? Reason. As an objective set. Mm. Yeah. Reason. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we will, we'll take that as a comment, and we'll go to our next questioner. It's Eddie Ozels. Gene Robinson, American comedian. Robin Williams has suggested that uh, Episcopalians are Catholic light. L I T E all the rituals, but only half the guilt. It seems he's saying that there is no God in all this. It's all about the bells and smells. Can you defend the existence of God to someone like Lawrence Krauss? Um, you can I, have, I, if you're I, sitting right there, you can have yeah, a crack exactly. at it. <laughs> uh, I have no need to um, convince Lawrence Krauss of anything. Uh, I am delighted to be uh, his colleague, and I'm also delighted to um, uh, affirm uh, the appropriate role of reason. Uh, I don't see it as an either or. I see it as a both and. I think we can be reasonable, logical, scientific people there in my, uh, and be religious. There is no conflict between religion and science. Science tells us what happens and religion tells us who made it happen. It's God who thought up the Big Bang. It's God who thought up evolution. How, how do you know that? <laughs> how do you know that? I, I mean, don't, you know, that's that. I, I mean, don't know that. Yeah, okay, good. I believe that. Oh, okay. <laughs> And, and, here's, and here's, my point would be, my particular believing of that allows me to treat uh, people with, um, I, I shoot for infinite respect of one another. I derive my own values from my own experience of God, and it motivates me uh, to be the kind of better person uh, that Amanda's talking about. So for me, that works. I don't have a need to convince you of that, and, and I can also uh, uh, respect. I think it's probably a good idea you don't have a need to do it, because the truth is, I don't think you did. Because um, he, he's, he's not going to be convinced by no, the, uh, no, no, but I think you'd about. accept, and I'm sure you'd accept the fact that I can feel exactly the same way about respecting people, and it's all based on the fact that I don't ha need to buy into those myths. I can come to the conclusions based on the evidence of reality and reason and decide it's reasonable to, be, to treat you with respect uh, and because it leads to a, a happier, happier for me and happier for you. So it's not as if I need that God to come to that conclusion. God is just redundant. It's not okay. necessary. All right, now Amanda Van Sone in the middle of that conversation. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Look, I, I have an admission to make. I think the gentleman, the young man in the front uh, has a point to make. I'm disappointed in all of the churches. I think they've let us down in a whole variety of ways. Um, but I do think there is a place for someone, certainly other than the state, and certainly other than just Rafferty's rules, uh, to come up with a, a set of moral values or a number of sets of moral values. Uh, I don't have the same confidence in reason uh, and rationale. Uh, there's pl plenty of books you can read to show that uh, cross-culturally you can come to different conclusions. And I don't think history shows that men left to their own devices always do good things. So the churches, in my mind, have had a role to play 
in guiding people as to what is a moral and good life to lead, but... They haven't always done it themselves. Well, they don't have the and, same moral. And it, no, they don't. But do we don't all have to be the same. We don't well, all have to be the same. Why is it any different than reason? Uh, well, <laughs> right. I think, okay. no, I think I'm reason's gonna, not to be trusted. Amanda, but the churches just, have... You've got a point. Amanda, I'm going to cross to the other end of the panel. I'd like to hear what Susan Ryan has to say about this. Well, I, th I think that uh, ha having a faith can inspire people to live very good lives. We have two mm -hmm. examples here. Um, I'm not sure about Amanda's status. You don't have to tell me what you're... Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm She's, a, it's not, she's but, a good liberal. But it's not, the only, <laughs> it's not the only thing. I mean, I know many people uh, in my own family, uh, Catholic nuns, priests and so on, who live a life of altruism, which I, uh, you know, with my political philosophy, <laughs> admire. But I agree with you, you don't need to have it. If it's there, you think, well, that's good. That's very fine. You're um, a sister of mercy who goes and works with the asylum seekers and so on. I really admire that. I respect it. I'll do what I can to help you. But there are other people who go and do similar good works from different motivation. So I would never knock someone's religious motivation. I would respect it when it was constructive and altruistic. But I can't see that you have to have that particular motivation. You don't have it, and these days I don't have it, and yet I hope we are pretty constructive people. Let me bring in uh, Fred, and we'll go back to Eddie Ozel's question, and really, do you want to have a crack at convincing the atheist of the existence of God? <laughs> well, I was interested, you keep talking about reality and uh, creation. Uh, I believe in reality. I believe in creation. When I see creation, uh, I just thank God who created it and I worship the creator. You're, you're in a vacuum. You don't know what you believe, uh, well, what's there. So no, 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 well, uh, yeah. He seems pretty clear to me. No, yeah. no in fact, you <laughs> no, know, he I think... know what he believes. I, I try not to use the word belief because I try to not decide what the answer is before I've asked the question. And, uh, and so I try to... Uh, in fact, I'm really happy about the fact that my faith is shakable. I can think of something... You know, I have a, I'm a physicist and most of what I do is wrong. Um, and because, and that's exciting because it means nature is telling me something new. And, and, and that's what's so exciting about science is the fact that we can actually change our minds. Instead of deciding in advance what's right as you have about, you claim to have done about homosexuality in the face of all evidence. And so that, that to me is the real problem is that you have to be willing okay, to I, change I, your I, mind. So I'm going to just pause this argument just for a moment because we've actually got it. We've got a question from uh, Trish Ellis, and it, uh, it does relate to what you were talking about a moment ago. Lawrence Krauss, you were quoted as saying you want to intelligently design our society, our ethics and our morality, so that we live in the kind of society we want to live in, rather than in the kind of society that was laid down in the Bible. So if we get rid of God and make ourselves the God instead through our progress in technology and science, we should be a far better race of people. But in actual fact, we now have the ability to destroy ourselves through science. Einstein once wrote that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. They need and complement each other. How do you respond to that? Okay. Well, uh, well, the first thing I want to say is the quote you gave was not mine, it was my friend Richard Dawkins. But, but, uh, but I think... I think what, when we establish laws and government, we try and intelligently design society. We try, laws and government in Australia as well as in my country, no matter what people say or not, are based on secular principles, okay? They're based on trying to organize people in a way to produce the maximum happiness, maximum comfort, etc. Now, I think that you're absolutely right that the products of science, the technology of science, can be used for many, in many different ways. But the point is that what we need to do is, if we're going to address the main problems of the 21st century, including the danger of nuclear weapons, we have to be honest about them. We have to be honest about things like the fact that the Earth, that the global warming is happening, and we have to deal with it, instead of just deciding in advance what the problem is. So what we have to do is say, let's make our policies be based 
on empirical evidence. Wouldn't that be amazing if we made our public policy and government based on reality Lawrence, instead can I, of can, ideology? Lawrence, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I just bring yeah. you to the, to the latter part of the question? Because Albert Einstein's not here that. on the panel, but Albert yeah. Einstein is the iconic genius. He, he clung to his belief. He wasn't really, you know, I'm so, you know, I didn't get to know him very well because he was dead before I born, but, but uh, uh, he's been misused, his quotes have been misused completely. He derided a personal God more than anyone else. When he talked about religion, he talked about order in the universe, the God of Spinoza, whatever you want to talk about. He made it quite clear, as many people do, that their religious beliefs, because no matter what you say, science, science is certainly compatible with some vague notion of a purpose to the universe. We can't ever disprove that there's some purpose in the universe. There's just no evidence for one. But it is incompatible with the detailed doctrines of the world's major religions, and Einstein argued that as strongly as anyone else. Okay, uh, Gene Robson, um, I mean, the quote uh, still remains, uh, if relig religion without science is blind, I think it was. Um, that was a quote from Einstein according to our uh, questioner. Um, what do you say? Well, I, I, I like the quotation in the sense that it ties the two together. And I think either one by themselves can be distorted and, and incomplete. Uh, so for me, for me, uh, putting the two together is really important. It, it, um, w where I uh, find science uh, a, a kind of shortcoming is that science can describe what is and, and how it works, but um, there is much that is unprovable that is also important to me. So a scientist can tell me uh, what, what makes a sunset colorful, um, how it works, how the curvature of the Earth uh, affects it, but it, it doesn't tell me about beauty. It doesn't tell me about watching that sunset and being inspired by it. Well, and well, so, I, so I, I would say that the two together are, are very much important. I couldn't agree more uh, with Lawrence about uh, basing our policies and our, our public stances and so on on the actual facts. And one of the things in America right now uh, that just makes me crazy is that uh, no one seems to think that the facts matter. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and we are getting into terrible trouble because of that. But okay, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to interrupt because Fred wants to I'd just like to there. challenge Lawrence that oh. the greatest fact is the fact of Jesus Christ. How do you know? He's, he's a reality, <laughs> and he came into this world to show us the way of salvation, and he said in is his that own teaching, he said he did? who do you say that I am? And so the question you have to ask, who was Jesus Christ? And what is his meaning, well, what is his meaning, his life, to you and his death, you talk about the crucifixion, what does it mean for you? Well, and it's a source of salvation. He well, died you know, for our when sins. When someone tells me they're God, the I tend not to believe it, okay? <laughs> it's just, a t you know, I, but have I, you studied, hold on. Are you open minded it, enough as I'm a scientist? I'm not even sure he was real, to, study, to tell you the truth. But, to study but Jesus Christ and to study the New Testament? Well, can I, can I, you, can, can, can I just are put you open minded Fred, enough? I just read, Fred, I'd like you to give me a When I was a kid, I read. Can I just put this to you as a counterpoint? Are you open-minded enough to accept the Muslim position that Muhammad is the greatest man in history? I don't believe he's the greatest man in history in the same way Jesus Christ was. Okay. Jesus Christ uh, uh, is the son of God. And that's, and, and you, had, that's because you've decided but, but he that, is. But that's factual history. You can actually well, study that. <laughs> factual history? There are, there are documents, there are historical documents that show that. That show what? It's not that a he myth. existed or that he's a it's son of God? Well, I'll tell you one and, thing, and uh, was born the, uh, so Muhammad certainly agreed that uh, Jesus Christ was a great prophet. Uh, yeah. So we'll leave that aside for one moment. We've got, we've got a few other questions to go to. You're uh, <laughs> watching Q&A. The next question is a video question. It comes from James Mackay in Orange, New South Wales. My question is to Mr. Nile. I have a terminal illness, motor neuron disease. Why did you not support the New South Wales Greens' right of the, rights of the terminal, terminally ill bill? By your actions, you have condemned me to a very painful, undignified death. Well, thank you for the question, and obviously you are suffering, and uh, I feel very sorry about that. But when we debated the euthanasia bill as a member of parliament, I have a responsibility, if we had have passed that law, what effect it would have uh, on people, aged people going into hospitals, would people feel at risk, okay. would it change the nature of our doctors? Doctors are committed to saving life. We give them the power to take life. We change the nature of the doctor's role. 
and if we have hospitals where patients' lives can be taken as well, then we change the nature of a hospital. Instead of saving life, you could lose your life in hospital. And we've had reports from the Northern Territory where a lot of the Aboriginal people are very fearful of going to hospitals in the Northern Territory because of the possibility of euthanasia uh, by a white bigoted doctor who's racist who would take the opportunity of removing numbers of uh, the Aboriginal population. And that's what they've said to me. So I want to protect life. I want to protect you too and, and have the proper palliative care. You should not be suffering any pain in our modern society with all the knowledge we have of palliative care, all the experts we have, all the money that's being spent, you should not be suffering. And I'm sorry you are. Susan Ryan. Well, I think we should be talking about voluntary euthanasia, and I presume yeah. that was what was, in, was the, the in, the, in the Greens bill. Voluntary euthanasia is something which philosophically I support and agree with. I do have some worries about the attempt to put it into legislation in, in this respect. I now come across mm. a lot of examples of elder abuse. That's frail old people being uh, abused by their families, sometimes for financial gain and so on. And I think we have to be very careful in getting voluntary mm -hmm. euthanasia laws that make sure that the frail older person is well protected against those who would exploit that person. And one of the particularly difficult areas of this is that friends of mine who say that they, they want voluntary euthanasia, they want the right, are often saying it um, in relation to a discussion about uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. But a problem I can't see my way around yet is that if a person has dementia, advanced dementia, then they're not in a position to, to make the voluntary decision. So somehow or other... They can they do it with an advanced medical yeah. directive. Advanced, exactly. advanced directive? Mm. Advanced okay. medical directive. Look, I, I, I agree that the mm. difficulty for legislators... I know plenty of people who philosophically agree mm. you should be able to say, I can't face this and I want to choose mm. to end my life and I need help to do it in a dignified and decent way. You should be able to choose that. The problem for legislators is exactly as you say. You've got an old person who is very frail, who knows they're near their end, and they know that if they said, see you later in the world, there'd be some assets so that the grandchild could, I don't know, go to un university yeah. or whatever. I mean, kids can now, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And there's pressure on someone yes. to say, yes. I want to give my life up. That is absolutely criminal and a terrible thing to allow and how to devise a bill as you, you both, we've both had this experience to exclude that mm. but give the rest of us the right we want to have is the hardest part uh, and so, can I just so say it's not yep. just the suffering look you can get plenty of pills and poppers and stuff to stop it, it's the indignity and the loss of the life that you were leading mm. that you're just uh, breathing as someone else not the person you were it's not the pain that guy's complaining about. That's not all he's complaining about. He wants to end his life as he is, not as someone he's become because we wouldn't let him go when he wanted to. Jean, let's hear from you on this. So uh, I would very much agree with Susan and Amanda on this. Um, uh, I think that part of a society's respect for each individual citizen uh, includes this right to die with dignity. Uh, I also agree that, that we've got some uh, thorny things to work through, certainly legislatively. Um, uh, I, I also remember that ethical choices are rarely between good and bad, but between two goods. Mm. And so uh, knowing how to balance those two things, mm, so both the protection okay. and the freedom, uh, is, is very complicated. But, but, but we can okay. do yeah, it. I'm going to open Sorry, Lawrence, we've got one yeah. last question. Uh, it is actually to you. It comes from uh, Chris Summers. Hi, Lawrence. Hugh Svange. Um, my question is this. Criticism of science by religious people is sometimes focused on a particular scientific theory. Um, the multiverse theory has been criticised by religious people as an example of science having faith in a guess made without evidence at all in order to explain a mystery. Um, it's been suggested that scientists have faith in their theory in the same way that religious people have faith in their God. So do scientists have evidence that are suggestive of a multiverse? Can, uh, can you give us a multiverse theory in 30 seconds? <laughs> yeah. Is that possible? <laughs> well, yeah, the, the difference between the multiverse and God is the multiverse is well motivated um, it, by, by evidence, okay? So we've been driven to it because of 
uh, of theories that actually do, do describe nature. And, uh, and so uh, those same theories can be tested. And so in fact, just like we knew atoms existed before we could see them, okay, it is true that if there are many universes, we're subject, and, and in my own field, I'm, I'm constantly reminded that we're limited, that we live in one universe. Most of us do. The Republican Party in my country doesn't. But, <laughs> but, uh, uh, the, and therefore, there are, some, there are some questions we can't empirically <laughs> test directly. But if, for example, we have a fundamental physics theory that makes 25 predictions, all of which agree with the data, and, and, one, and the 26th prediction is that in the early universe, those same physical processes would have resulted in an early expansion that would produce many different regions that are causally disconnected, there'd be no reason not to, it, not to accept that fact. But the, diff the other huge difference if, is, however, that if there was any evidence against it, we'd throw it out like yesterday's newspaper. That's not the faith of religion. It's the fact that we, we make a theory, we test it, and we throw it out with impunity if it's wrong, and that's the hallmark of science. Lawrence, um, uh, I remember, very briefly, because we're, we're running out of time quite quickly, but I remember uh, the last time you were on this show, mm -hmm. uh, we went back uh, into the green room, and I said to you, is it possible the multiverse, that is multiple yeah. universes, could have existed at the time of the Big Bang? And I, my, from memory, you said yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, in fact, it's quite, if you look at what we now know about fundamental physics, it's quite likely it's, it, that our universe isn't unique. Almost all of the theories we have suggest our universe isn't unique. Now. But at you, the same time, you argue that the Big Bang sprang from nothing. But it can't if there are multiple universes. Oh, it certainly it can. There was nothing there. when, it, when There was absolutely no space, no time, no matter, no radiation. Space and time themselves popped into existence, which is one of the reasons why it's hard to... But only in that universe. Only in that universe. That's right. But Lawrence, exactly. you have to ask the question, why are the majority of scientists believers in God. Actually, it's not true. It is in my true. It is country, true. 90 percent of the scientists in the National Academy of Sciences in my country, the, the, the highest ranking group in the world, 90 percent of them don't believe in God. In, in the Royal Society, all the scientists, 80 all percent. Scientists. Uh, in, fact, it, in fact, the point, you know what? Again, most, some people think God is important to science. It isn't. The point is that, again, as Steve Weinberg said, most scientists don't think enough about God to even know if they're atheists. It never comes up because it's not relevant to trying to understand how the universe works. I've never heard it discussed in a scientific well, meeting. It's just not an issue. Surveys. It's irrelevant. There have been yeah, Fred, surveys. Fred, mm. I, I think mm. I can help you with one thing at least, and that is that any God worth following wants converts, not conscripts. So... Religious people should stop looking to parliaments to conscript people in to a belief that they don't adopt. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. The laws of the universe have dictated that we're out of time. Um, that's all we have time for on our panel tonight. Lawrence, please welcome our panel. Uh, please thank our panel, I should say. Lawrence Krauss. We'll go again. We can start again in another universe. Uh, Amanda Van Stone, Jean Robinson, Fred Nile and Susan Ryan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next Monday, we'll be joined by Canadian songstress Martha Wainwright, American environmentalist Bill McKibben, Financial Review editor Michael Stutchbury, renegade Liberal Senator Corey Bernardi, and writer and feminist historian Anne Summers. And make sure you tune in tomorrow at 8.30pm for an extra edition of Q&A when Bill Gates, the world's richest man and most generous philanthropist, will face your questions. Uh, if you think you know everything about the geek who changed the world, think again. Now, just one more thing before we go. Q&A was five years old this week. No other program asks so much from its audience, so please accept our thanks for making Q&A work. We're having a great time here. And uh, we'll leave you tonight with just a few of the highlights from the last five years. Until the Bill Gates Q&A tomorrow night at 8.30, good night. Good evening and welcome to the very first Q&A, what we like to call a new adventure in democracy where you get to ask the questions. How big of a tool is Mark Latham? <laughs> My question doesn't actually go out to the panel tonight, it goes to this beautiful girl next to me. Will you marry me? And you can join the live Twitter conversation by following the hashtag, whatever that is, on your screen right now. You're a parliamentarian in Australia who believes the world you live in is less than 10,000 years old. I, 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 I remain caught in the illusion of Maya ordinary reality. I perceive myself as an agent killing you. What the fuck? Oh my God. <laughs>
I'm a fucking lunatic. What was a Facebook question? <laughs> Bob Barry's just going to deal with his phone. Uh, that's probably your agent just wondering if that was a very good joke. Hello. <laughs> You've got a big ass, Julia. Just get on. I'm just kidding. That's just ABC crowd. I love it. Um, I would have expected more applause for a cheap one. <laughs> Should perhaps the Australian people consider charging you with treason? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, no, 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 no we're not going to do that. Jen, Please. And this is for so, your right someone... Forget it, forget it. OK, you're so watching relax. You've, you've, you've <laughs> never considered it? But forming a political party with Kevin. <laughs> Malcolm and I could never agree on the leadership. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you and Julia couldn't either. <laughs> Watching Q and A, it's live and unusual. With anything that's going to do this, cook it up. Who said that? So we'll take that as a comment. <laughs> ah, those were the days. Oh, has it? One brief example.